Awesome. I'm so, so glad to be here. If you're here from Honey's Church, wave at me. Okay, cool. If you're here from Desert Streams, can I see where you are? Okay. And then from Miss Donna's Church, awesome. And then where are my people? Oh, Kaylee and Becca. They're from my church. They're passing out outlines right now. These are just general outlines to kind of help us keep track of where we're going um, this morning in this first session. I love the theme of this conference. Now, I have to ask you, how do you pronounce the word that's on the wall behind me? Sela. Oh. Uh, who said Sela? Sela. How many? If you say Sela, where are the Sela girls? If you say Sela, I think that I say Sela, but I think the right way might be Sela. I'm not sure. Whatever way you say it is the right way. We're going to talk about that in a second. But regardless, I love the word, right? Um, and I love what the word means, and we're going to talk about that in this session. So um, just for the sake of helping you know where we're going, this first session I feel like is a little bit more devotional in nature, and I really want to emphasize who God is and how he can bring uh, peace and restoration in our life. And then in the next session, you don't have to stick around for it. But if you do, we're gonna, it's maybe a little more practical talking about, okay, now I know who God is, so in the next session, what does God, who does God say I am? And how do these truths play out in my life so that I can have peace and comfort and, and joy as I go through life's journey? Um, so we were just talking about how to pronounce Sela slash Sela. And um, I am one of these, those people who enjoys like words. Do you know, talk, anybody else resonate with this? Okay, like maybe just like what they mean, um, where they came from. There's a word for it, etymology, right? Is that the study of words? Okay, what is it? Etymology, yeah, okay. So um, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's mostly written in Hebrew. And when you take a Hebrew word and you translate it into an English word, it's called a translation, okay? So like the Hebrew word for earth is Eretz, and we have an English equivalent, it's earth, and so it translates. But there are some Hebrew words that maybe we don't have an English equivalent for, um, or some words that we just take from the Hebrew or another language, and we take the sounds and we create our own English word for it. Um, this is called transliteration, okay? So it's not translation, but transliteration. And as an example, our word hallelujah is a transliteration from the Hebrew word that means uh, praise God, okay? So praise is Hallel, and God is Yah, hallelujah, okay? So uh, Sela, or Sela, is actually a word that is transliterated, and we don't have an English word for it, but when we say the word Sela, it's trans transliterated, so generally we are saying it the same way that believers have said this word uh, for, since uh, the Bible times. And when we read scripture and we come to this word Sela, it sounds the same, it's the exact same word that crosses language barriers, and we can join in song, so to speak, with believers of the Old Testament who would have used this word. And it's a very powerful musical word, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, but this word Selah was used mostly in the, in the Psalms, in the Bible, also it's used a few times in Habakkuk, where songs are referenced. And uh, this word um, signified a rest or a pause in the song. So when you got to this word and you were singing these songs, when you see Selah, you pause and you reflect and you consider the words of the song. And I don't know most of you in here, but I think in a room this size with women in here, uh, it's safe to say that we could all use a pause or a rest in life's song, right? I love this theme because it resonates with all of us because no matter where we are on our journey, uh, rest is a, is a welcome, what's the word I'm looking for? action, right? And not even an action. It's like a non-action. That's why it's so welcome. Uh, we enjoy rest and we want it. So um, my family has just come through a very busy season of life, okay? So I know that is true for most of you. Does anyone have kids in sports in here? Okay. <laughs> baseball. My boys are actually playing their last game today, okay? So uh, for baseball season, I know. I'm like, I'm so sorry. It's your last game. Praise God, you know? But um, we've come through a busy season for, like, just even in our church. I know most of you have, but, like, 
from um, February to May. It's like go time, and you go, go, go from one event to another. Um, you know, it's Easter, and for us, we've had conferences and offerings and a wonderful, great events that just kept us moving. And then in our family, my boys are getting old enough where they have a lot of projects due now in, in this final semester of school, and we're making dioramas and science projects, and I hate doing Mars posters and all of it, you know? And we're staying up late, and it just seems like one thing after another, and it's been an intentionally full season, like it's been good, uh, but I don't know if you're here, but I've been looking forward to summer because in the rhythm of life, summer gives like a, a natural pause. So we've been pushing towards summer, and it's almost here, so we're like, okay, school's almost out, baseball's almost over, but having said that, um, I tend to dream, uh, a lot, like every night, okay? So I think that means that my brain probably doesn't turn off like it should. Like I have, I dream just about every night and I remember almost everything I dream when I wake up. And the poor people who have to listen to me tell them my dreams and they could care less. And you are gonna become one of those poor people because I'm gonna tell you my dream from two nights ago, okay? So two nights ago, I went to bed and I was so tired and I just kind of had this thought, it's been busy, but we're almost to the end of, the, of this busy season. And um, so I went to sleep and I had this dream that things had gotten so busy at our church that um, one of the deacons decided to get a bed to put at the church so that when Peter and I needed a rest, we could just go lay in that bed and then get right back to work after we took a rest. So in my dream, I, I woke up in that bed and I had, this is funny to me, but I had perfectly cute and modest pajamas, like totally church appropriate pajamas, if you were to have church appropriate pajamas. <laughs> And I had like the little collar, you know, and I woke up, I was out of bed, but I hadn't changed yet. So I'm like walking in my cute pajamas and here comes the deacon and he's like, hey, how's that bed for you? You guys getting some rest? And then we're getting back to work and I woke up out of my nightmare, you know, and I was like, oh, wow, like it's so busy that like, you know, I'm having these dreams that people are like trying to help me rest, but it's really just making me work more because I can't even go home. And sometimes, you know, life can feel like that where you're just so busy that you're just taking cat naps or you're just trying to get little you know, coffee runs to keep you going. And then when the people who love you even try to help, it's actually not super helpful, you know? And uh, maybe even their help creates more work for you, which is a bummer when that happens. You all are nodding like aggressively. <laughs> this is good. Okay, so sometimes our lives are not characterized by Sela. They don't have pause, they don't have rhythm, there is no rest. And so the definition of Sela is to pause to consider, to reflect. And I love that this word doesn't just give you permission to rest and to pause, but it encourages you to. Like the song doesn't sound good unless you pause. And the rhythm and the song of your life will not be the beautiful music God intends for it to be if you do not rest. And so in Psalm 46, I love this because this is the passage we're going to today. It actually has three sections. So you can think of it like three verses to a hymn. And uh, these three verses form a song, and at the end of each section is the word Selah. So it's mentioned three times just in this chapter. And David actually did not write this song. He wrote most of the Psalms, but not this one. This song was written by King Hezekiah. And it is believed that he wrote this song when he was the king in Jerusalem, and he was surrounded by the Assyrian army and King Sennacherib. And they're surrounding Jerusalem, and uh, they are about, the, the, the people in Jerusalem are about to be destroyed. And uh, since school is on my mind, because I've been helping my boys study, and my oldest, Camden, has been studying for a language test, because since I love words, he will get an A on the language test if I have anything to do with it, right? So we've been studying, and we've been talking about verb tenses. And it's interesting, in this chapter, Psalm 46, if you look at the verb tenses, Hezekiah talks about past, present, and future worries. Uh, problems and struggles. And so we're going to look at this uh, passage of scripture and we get the idea that Hezekiah, like the world is just like spinning around him with, cr you know, craziness. And, and it's like no matter where he looks, like back, forward, or right here in the present, he's surrounded by trouble and chaos. Um, and so we're going to take those verb tenses and kind of create an outline to help us uh, walk through the, the, the verses of Psalm 46. And first of all, the first point here is when I think about the future, I can have faith in the help of God. Okay, when I think about the future, I can have faith in the help of God. And we joked a second ago about when people want to help you and they don't do a very good job. When my boys want to help me, you know, I sometimes don't want their help because I want to do it the right way myself, all right? And I love that when God helps us, it's the right kind of help. It's efficient and supporting help. And we read this in Psalm 46, 1 through 3. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Therefore, will we not fear? This is where the future aspects are coming in. Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Um, a couple weeks ago, I went with my son Chandler. Oh, that's another thing that we did this semester, field trips, okay? So we went on a field trip and um, Again, I probably sound like I have a bad attitude, but field trips really aren't my thing either. I don't know why I feel that way. At least not this one, okay? Because I've been on this one before. It's like this three-hour harbor cruise with a bunch of third graders. And, and um, I did it with my firstborn son, and we went to the aquarium, and we do all these things. So um, but I, I actually recruited my mom to go with me, and um, I got Chandler in the car, and I had my niece who's in his class, and we're gonna, I had a good attitude. I knew to bring snacks this time. Um, I had my coffee. I was, I, I was ready to chat with the other moms and do the field trip thing. And as we were driving down, my dad sent a text to my mom and I, and it was um, some sort of like weather advisory that he had gotten. And it said, um, like the advisory was, don't go out into the ocean today, basically. But it said it more scientifically than that. But it was like, don't go out in the ocean. Um, a storm is coming. And the storm has waves that could capsize large and small vessels. That's like the part I remember, large and small vessels. Because at first, you know, you're thinking, I'll be in a big boat. No worries, you know. But it said large and small. And I was like, leave it to my dad to send us this. And I don't even want to go on the boat anyway. But I'm trying to have a good attitude. We did the aquarium. It was tra- time to get on the boat. And I'm, I'm noticing the weather. And it's beautiful. The sun is shining. I don't see any clouds. And it's like a harbor cruise, right? So I'm like, we're, gonna, we're just whale watching in the harbor. So it's going to be fine. So we got on the boat. And I found like this nice spot where I was going to sit and look at whales. And we go through the harbor. And we saw whales, which is like you know, a success, because you never know for sure if you're going to, and we saw whales, and then um, the captain or whoever got on the loudspeaker, and he said, all right, now we're going to go look for some dolphins, and we start going out in the ocean, and I'm like, okay, but there's still no clouds or anything, so we're going out full speed ahead, the kids are having a great time, and I'm not kidding you, about 30 minutes into it, like, we were really in a storm situation, okay? Like the waves were really, really strong. And I can hardly swim. Like I can float and flap my hands, but I cannot like rescue you. I can't do anything. So I actually like have a few fears and drowning in the ocean is absolutely one of them. And so the storm, like it's like getting really like rocky. And you know how like you start to get nervous, but you look around to see if anyone else is nervous, you know? So like I'm looking around and all the other moms are like, you know, holding on, but they're like smiling for their kids. <laughs> And I look out, because I was sitting by like a window, and our boat wasn't just like going like this, like it was going like this, so that the waves were coming up above, and they had to close the doors because water was coming in into the boat. So now I like legit, like I went from like, uh, to like, I'm definitely scared. And so I'm like, okay, and um, I'm like, Chandler, sit here and just stay by mom, it's okay. But that's all I said to comfort him was it's okay, because like I'm stressing out. So I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I called Peter, because we were close enough, I still had service, Peter's my husband. I was like, Peter, if you're on a boat that you think might capsize, should I stay down here inside by the life jackets, or should I go to the top so that I'm not stuck under the boat when it like tips over? And he's like, are you kidding me? Can can Chandler hear you right now? And I'm like, yes, we are all freaking out. Thank you very much. (laughs) And so, um, seriously, when Chandler heard that, he started getting like little tears in his eyes. And so um, I'm like, here, talk to your dad. And usually I do so good in these scenarios, but not this time. I could not think of one Bible verse. I could not think of one comforting thing to say. I just knew we were heading into the storm. And that wind advi- the, the advisory for the storm was like in my mind. And so, you know, Peter talks to Chandler and he tells him that even the winds and the seas obey him. And remember when God calmed the storm? And I'm like, that's not really even helping me right now. It helped Chandler. Thankfully, Chandler was fine, but I didn't have any faith. And so I'm sitting there, and now everyone start like, everyone, but most of the people where I was, they started throwing up. So now it's like waves, and it's like people getting sick, and we cannot stand up. And so I'm looking, like, who works on this boat, you know? So I went to the girl selling sodas, and I'm like, hi, would you consider this normal for, like, going? Because we're not turning around. We're just going straight into the storm. And she's like, yeah, this is fine. I mean, this happens every once in a while. And then I'm looking at her and I'm like, I don't trust you. Because, you know, she's like younger than me. She's just selling the soda. So I'm like, where's the captain? Is he available? And she's like, yeah, you can talk to him if you want. And I'm like, great, where is he? And she's like, he's upstairs. So I said, okay, we're going to do this. So I walked up to the captain. I knocked on his door. And I was like, I'm sorry, but did you see the weather advisory for today? 
And he's looking at me like, who does she think she is? And he's like, yeah, there's like a little weather, weather pattern out here. And um, I'm like, yeah, it's actually a major one. And it was recommended that we didn't go into the ocean. And I, it said boats could capsize. And he's like, oh, that's just for smaller boats. So then I'm like, all right. So I pulled it out, and I'm like, look, it says small and large vessels. And I was like, we need to turn the boat around. And he looked at me like, no, we don't. We have to stay on schedule. People paid for this, and we're just going to keep going. And I'm like, our lives are at stake. So he's not listening to me. So I went down, and I called the office. And I was like, you have a captain who is refusing to turn around in the storm. Meanwhile, the storm is going crazy. Chandler's crying. Leighton, my niece, is crying. And uh, they said the captain's skilled, he knows what to do, he will turn around when it's time. And so finally, eventually, I'm here to tell the story, he did turn around, I think it had nothing to do with me, and I think he turned around, I'm, why am I telling you this? There was something, there was an application here. Telling you? I don't even know where I am. Oh, yes, oh, okay. So here is what I'm trying to tell you. I think I kind of watched, lost the punchline, but honey knows I do that with every story I tell. I forget like, like the really good line and point. But we made it. We cleaned up the throw up. We got back, okay? But sometimes we go through life and we feel like I felt on that boat where you're just looking at a storm and you don't have a choice. Like you're stuck on the boat and you're going forward and you're going right into it. And when you see your future, all you see are the fears and the what ifs and the potential. Um, I kept thinking, it's just gonna take one wave. That's all it takes for this boat to totally like capsize. And sometimes we go through life and it's like, if there's one more thing that happens, I'm over this. Like this is gonna be the end of it for me. And the Bible talk gives us this picture. It says, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, uh, it says, though the mountains are falling into the sea, though the seas are swirling and covering the earth, it's painting this picture that the whole world is unstable. And it gives us a mental picture that is the exact opposite of Genesis 1, when God created per the perfect world, and he separated the land from the water, and it was beautiful, and it was peaceful, and it was perfect. And now everything's distorted, and it's uh, in total contrast to the perfection that God had designed. There's confusion, there's distortion, there's sickness, there's war. Um, even in the world that we live in today, I'm not talking about physically speaking in terms of like the land and the sea, but the, the culture that we live in, um, there is wickedness on high places. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at the future and I'm like, I don't know if I want inflation and a recession and all these things. I don't know if I want my kids to grow up in a world that looks like this, you know? I was talking to Chandler the other day, my second born who was on the boat, and I saw something in the news that made me like realize like Christians, we're gonna be persecuted in the end times. We know that the Lord is on his throne and he gives us the victory, but it's not gonna get easier for those of us who believe the Bible and what the Lord says. And so I started thinking about Chandler and Camden growing up in this world where they may be persecuted for their faith and I want them to be strong warriors and men of God, you know. So Chandler and I were going to a dentist appointment and I felt like now was the moment that we were gonna have a talk about that. So I'm like, Chandler, he asked me something about 4th of July or whatever. And, and then we were talking about America and you know, how it's not, you know, a good, I don't know, like there's sin in, our, in the country or whatever. And so I was like, Chandler, I was like, what if, you know, someday when you grow up, um, someone comes up to you and they like, they have a gun and they say, you know, if you believe in Jesus, I'm going to shoot you. Do you believe in Jesus? I was like, what would you say? And Chandler, he kind of like sat up and he said, I would say, shoot me because he <laughs> believes in Jesus, you know? And I'm like, okay, good. At least he believes in Jesus. I told my dad that. He's like, Danielle, you do not need to be having these discussions with your nine-year-old. <laughs> and I'm like, that is true, but I just needed to know if he would stand firm. So, because we look at the world and it's just crazy. But Psalm 46 tells us that God can be trusted even when the world is going crazy and even when everything we see seems distorted and not right. And God, we can trust God when the whole world seems crazy, but we can trust God when our world seems crazy, when, when on a personal level things are hard for us. When, and I love that this verse says though, like even though, even if is another way you could read that, even if the mountains are cast in the sea and even if this happens and even if that happens, do you guys ever um, think to yourself, what if, you know, what if this happens? What if I can't find baby formula? That's like a real fear, right, for the people who need it. What if um, inflation continues to rise? What if I enter, we enter a recession? What if I do get cancer? What if that test comes back and with an answer I don't want it to be? Um, I want to encourage you today that as you look ahead and see a storm, remember what the first part of that verse says, God is your refuge and your strength. And that is the truth of this passage. He hides you and he helps you. He's your refuge and your strength. He hides and he helps. And you can look ahead at the future with confidence. 
Yeah, you see a storm, but you see a God who is your refuge and your help. And so you can face the storm with him. Aren't you thankful that God's not like the captain on the boat I was on who's like, hey, we got to get our money's worth out of this. You know, we're going forward. God cares about you. He loves you. He wants to help you. He is your refuge and strength. Then number two, when I look to the past, I have hope in the promises of God. And we're going to talk about this, but I have to tell you, I don't know why my stories are all about Chandler, but Chandler has naturally very crooked teeth, okay? So when we went to the orthodontist, even the orthodontist was like, okay, like trying to like say something positive. He's like, Chandler, you've got some gnarly teeth, you know? And he's like, he's going to need a lot of work. And he, and like the, the skeleton, the um, like x-ray, honestly, legit looks scary, you know? Look kind of like, okay, he got it from his dad. I don't know. I'm just kidding. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so when Chandler had to get braces on, like, I just knew it was going to be kind of like, you know, awkward because his teeth were just so, you know, needing braces, like very obviously. So when you add braces to it before they start to straighten out, it's just like a mouthful of braces, you know? So we were trying to give him, you know, just like encouragement, like Chandler, it's okay because, you know, like your teeth are going to get straight and this is like so awesome that you can, that you can get braces. And my sister's like, Chandler, um, if someone at school calls you brace face, just don't even worry about it. It's okay. Cause we were worried that people were really going to tease him because of how he was going to look. And so we went in to get his braces on. And when he comes out, he reminded me, I think it's like finding email, that girl in the orthodontist, you know, or like all of her braces. And so I'm like, Oh, Chan. And Chandler walked out and he looked up at me and he said, I feel so confident. And I said, I'm so glad. That's awesome. And I thought to myself, why did he feel confident? Well, first of all, mostly because he had the encouragement of people who loved him, who spoke truth to him, like this will help you. And this will make all the crooked things straight in your mouth. And this passage here is telling us, look, God's here to help you and he'll make everything that's not right, right. And we can have confidence in that because of God's promise in verses four through seven. So we'll read these. It says, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. Now we're looking back. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So what promises can we be confident in? This is not in your notes, but just three confidences, uh, three promises from this passage. Number one, the promise of restoration. When you look back in your life, I hope, hopefully you see the faithfulness of God to you. But the reality is, and, and that is the reality, God's faithfulness. We would not be here today if it wasn't because of God's faithfulness to us. But sometimes we look back in our life and we see disappointment and we see mistakes that we have made. Uh, sometimes we look back with regret at our poor choices and we look back at maybe broken relationships. These are all consequences of living in a fallen world. And just like we looked at the storm raging in the first couple verses, when you get here to, the, to verse 4, the Bible says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Isn't that just a pretty verse? There is a river. It just makes you want to take a breath. Like, okay, like here's, here's a peaceful scene entering this song in this second verse. And what we see here is that God promises that he will restore beauty. And what we see is an, is an image now back again to the Garden of Eden in Genesis where there's a river in this garden. And it's beautiful and it's perfect and it's peaceful. And it's the way God intended life to be before the fall. God is telling the people in, in Hezekiah's time and Hezekiah is reminding them that God can restore beauty to the things that are broken. And so the verse says, um, the river will make the city of God glad. So the city of God is Jerusalem, right? But do you know that Jerusalem is a city that does not have a river? There is no river in the city of Jerusalem. And it's very unusual for ancient cities to not be built on a large, significant body of water. Most of the ancient cities that you'll study, they have this, they, they, they need to be built on a body of water. And Jerusalem doesn't have a large body of water. It does have streams and maybe small, um, small water sources, but nothing significant. And what Hezekiah, is, this is interesting because Hezekiah, when he was fighting the Assyrians and King Sennacherib, um, he actually built an aqueduct under the city of Jerusalem to block the bodies of water, the, the streams that they did have, so that King Sennacherib could not have access to them. And to this day, you can even Google Hezekiah's aqueduct. And would you know it, I went to Jerusalem and... 
they took us to see this, and I was pregnant, and they're like, you might fall down. And so I was like, okay, I'll sit in the car, and I missed it. I could have seen his aqueduct, but I didn't get to. But here's the deal. He made this aqueduct so that he could bring all the water sources through Jerusalem while keeping it away from the enemies. And here he's saying, hey, you know, one day there's going to be a real river in Jerusalem that God gives. And it, this is a prophetic blessing because if you look in Revelation 22, we won't do it. But God actually promises that at the, when he restores the new heaven and the new earth, there will be a river that flows out of the temple in Jerusalem through Jerusalem. And so here he's saying one day there's going to be a river. There is a river that's going to make us so glad. God will restore what has been destroyed in our city. But then it's, to me, it's a personal blessing because do you know that in scripture, when there's a river of water or a, a water source, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. And it's a reminder that God, it gives us this river of replenishing nourishment in our spiritual lives to be able to face the, the struggles that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. There will be joy again. Uh, God will renew the work. God will create a river. And in our lives, he'll give us that replenishment He'll give us the source of strength that we need. And then we have the promise, not just that he'll restore, but that he will, that he will be with us. It's his presence. That's a promise here. And uh, the second section of the song, you, you were reading about this peaceful city, but then the tone changes and you realize that there's a beautiful river, but the city is actually under siege. The heathen are raging, um, kingdoms are being moved, and the city is, is, is peaceful even when all this trouble is surrounding it. Uh, we went to uh, Disneyland several years ago when my boys were little, and we wanted to see that water show, and now I can't think of the name of it, that was uh, California Adventure. Was it like water, world water? World of color, okay. And so um, we had been several times, we had passes at this point in our life, but we um, had never seen World of Color. And so we were so excited, we planned to stay till nighttime to see World of Color where they like spray water up and then project like images on the screen and you watch this whole thing. So we got a spot that we thought was good, but we weren't sure, we had never seen the show before. And we were kind of settled in, we had strollers and bags and all this because our boys were little. And then someone walked up to us from the front and they're like, we can't stay for the show. Do you want like our reservation tickets for the front? And so we were like, are you kidding? Yes, we do. And so we like made this whole scene trying to get our stroller up there. We finally got right to the front, front got all situated. And the show starts, and I don't know if you've ever been up front on the show, but it's like, there's a reason I think those people gave us those tickets, because when the water starts spraying, it's like torrential downpour right there. And so we're like trying to have a good attitude, like, isn't this fun? You know, like, give me the umbrella. And um, so the, the show's going, and we're, we're like li literally getting so wet, but we're trying to have fun. And then I don't remember exactly what Disney movie comes on, but I feel like it was like, getting more intense. It's like Lion King and Mufasa and fire and then Ursula and like all this like scary stuff. And there was like a moment I looked up and I'm like, we literally have rain and wind and fire and dramatic music. And I'm like, my poor boys, you know, cause I thought they might be scared, they're little. And I looked over and Chandler who was originally in his, in his stroller uh, had gotten into Peter's arms and Peter was holding him and he had his head on Peter's shoulder and he had fallen asleep. He is just laying there sound asleep in his dad's arm. And I, I really pray that that is a picture of our lives, that when the craziness is happening around us and we are under siege, that we remember that God is in the midst of us, like God is here. And he's not just watching you suffer, he's holding you in your trying times and in your difficult times. And he's giving you the peace that, that Chandler had when he could sleep in his father's arms while everything around him was crazy. So God wants to give us his presence. And then the promise of his perfect timing, and I'm almost done, but the promise of his perfect timing. I love that this verse says, God shall help her in that right early. I love perfectly timed events, but in my life, I'm not really good at perfect timing, okay? So I'll give you an example, back to baseball. Camden, my firstborn, was having a baseball game a couple weeks ago, and um, our league doesn't do the mercy rule, so sometimes these games go like three hours. And so I'm like, it's windy and it's hot and I'm sitting outside and um, Camden's team was like in the outfield. So I told Peter, do you think it's okay if I just go use the restroom? I didn't even wanted to get away from baseball for just a minute. So I was like, I think I, I asked him if it was okay because I was trying to time it right. Like, do you think I'll miss anything Camden does if I go now? And he's like, just go now. It's fine. So I went to the restroom and I'm walking back and they have an app where you can actually, maybe some of you use this, but you can watch the plays on the app, you know, as you know, if you're not there. So I'm walking back and I pulled out my phone to look at the app to make sure I wasn't missing Camden when he was, if he was getting up to bat. 
And as I looked at my app, I was walking downhill on gravel, and you guys, I just like biffed it, like really hard. And, and like, I think I was graceful because I'm used to falling in front of people, so I knew like, put my feet together, go down, you know, because I like, can be klutzy. But man, I fell really hard. And you, what's the first thing you do? You look up, you're like, who saw me, you know? So, but I'm trying to be graceful, like, did anyone see me? Okay, you know? And um, people saw me, just so you know. So I'm like trying to like, uh, you know, be all right. And as I'm going down, I hear everybody just, the fans going crazy, and I, you know, brush everything off, and I get situated, get back down there. And do you know that while I was falling gracefully down the gravel, Camden got his first home run of the whole season, and I missed it. I couldn't believe that. And so, um, I, I, of course, I get up there, and Camden's like, did you see my home run? And I was like, I was there for it, because I was there for it. I was just wiping gravel off myself, but I was there for it. But timing sometimes isn't my thing. But I love that God says he will help us in that right early. That's translated that God will help us, uh, what is, oh, just at the break of dawn. Just at the break of dawn. It reminds me of the phrase, just in the nick of time. Or maybe more accurately, according to this passage, just at the right time. Like just when you feel like the darkness cannot go any longer, God comes in and brings morning into your life. And just at the break of dawn, he helps us. So we have the promise of his peace, of his presence. We have confidence in his perfect timing. We have the hope of his restoration. And as we're looking behind us and we're looking back, we see trouble, but we know that God is in the middle of it with us and he's restoring us. And the psalmist in the second verse ends it with the word Selah. Stop and think about that. Have the peace that I want to give you in the midst of life's storms. And then number three, as I live in the present, I have rest because of the power of God. As I live in the present, I have rest because of the power of God. In this third stanza, the verb tense changes one more time, and this time to the present tense. And we see it right away in verse 8. He says, come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. So as you live in the present, do you have rest in your life right now because of the power of God? Just kind of answer that to yourself. Like if... Like if someone asked you to characterize your life, um, yeah, maybe your schedule's full, but do you have rest in your soul and your spirit? Um, Are you getting enough physical rest? Because that's very important. Can your life be characterized by rest? Because the power does not belong to you. It belongs to God. Um, When, I don't know if you're like this, but when my life is stressful, my self-effort goes into overdrive, okay? So I'm like, all right, you want to do this? Let's do it. You know, I roll up my sleeves, I put on my superwoman cape, and I'm like, we are doing this. And I get like, like I almost, but here's, I get energized by it, but only temporarily, okay? So you can get like, yeah, we, you know, we can push through this, let's do it. And I start working hard, and then I actually start priding myself in my self-effort. Like, I'm like, look at what I'm doing. Like, this is, this, I'm, I'm knocking it out. And then, I don't know if you do this, I'm just being honest, I want people to know that I'm knocking it out of the park. You know what I'm saying? So I tell Peter, like, did you see, like, everything I got done today? Like, that was pretty amazing. Or I'll ask my boys, I, did you like the lunch I made you at school today? Like, they could care less, but I'm like, that was a great lunch. You know, healthy, checked all the boxes, it was fun. And I start talking about the work that I do. And, yeah, I can make, like, aqueducts or whatever, like Hezekiah did. Like, that's cool. Like, that was helpful in the time. But here he's saying, come behold the works of the Lord. Like, yeah, like, that was great that we got King Sennacherib about it. But let's now look at what God is doing because God has the power. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live lives that instead of being like me saying, look at what I did, we can say, come behold what God did in my life. Like, look at what God has helped me do. Look at the peace he brought to my life. Look at the restoration he brought to my relationships. Look at the victory he's given me over this addiction. Come look at what God is doing in me and through me. Because if we are relying on self-effort and we are checking off boxes and we feel like we are so proud of our to-do list, but we're doing it in our own effort, it is first of all in vain, and second of all, we will get very tired very quickly. And that burst of energy, it's kind of like getting like a a caffeine kick for a little bit. You, have a, you, you get even more tired and more drained and more discouraged because you're looking to yourself and others for the sense of accomplishment, peace, and rest that only God can give. So he says, come, behold the works of the Lord. And look at the action verbs. 
God, God goes to battle for us. He makes wars to cease. He breaks the bows. He cuts the spear. He burns the chariot. I, I have boys, so I feel like they would just love these verses. You know, God comes in, and he just, like, goes to... Is it me? No. He takes care of everything. He goes to battle for us. God fights for you, so let God work in your life. And then remember, this is like the second point, that God is in control. Okay? God is in control. So here in verse 10, um, we are in present tense, but now God's voice actually breaks through this song. So now it's Hezekiah talking about the Lord, but now God's talking, and he says, Be still and know that I am God. Um, God is primarily speaking to the world when he steps into this scene because there's a lot of craziness going on. And he steps in and he essentially says, silence, like stop. And there will come a day when God will silence the ignorance of, uh, of foolish men that the Bible talks about. Um, I have two boys, but like a million nieces, okay? And so when all of my family gets together and I have all these nieces, it's a different kind of noise that I know I had when I was little too. But I mean, it's the unicorns and the glitter and the squealing and all of it. And there are, there are some times when all of us are just like my siblings and our spouses, we were like, we should get babysitters for family get-togethers, you know, because we can't like enjoy a peaceful meal. And sometimes I hear a parent just go in there and say, everybody, stop for a second. Let's just like, stop, you know, because it's, so, it's crazy town with all the cousins right now. And this is what God is, he's stepping into this crazy scene and he's saying, stop. And he's telling unbelievers to stop and he's going to get victory eternal victory over them but then there is a secondary application to believers where he's saying be still and the message to us is to surrender because be still comes from a hebrew word rafa okay you're going to love the meaning of this word it means to sink in or to relax literally god is telling you to relax he's I'm in control. I, I mean, I'm out proving it. I'm like breaking bows. I'm cutting spears in half. I'm going to battle for you. I'm in the midst of it with you. So you can just surrender. You can lay down your weapons. You can stop fighting. You can cease from your self-effort. Acknowledge that God is the one who truly brings the victory. He is sovereign ruler over creation. So God says, you don't have to. You don't have to fight these battles. You will do it for you. You can be still. But he tells us to be still and know. I used to read this as like a checklist because I'm a checklist person, right? So, okay, be still, check, I sat still, and know that I'm God. Okay, good, I know. Yep, you are God. Good, okay, let's get back to work, right? But this, the meaning of this verse is essentially to be still in order to know that he is God. Because when I'm moving, I'm acting like in this self-effort type of a way, I'm acting like I am God in my life. So he's saying be still so that you can know that I am God. The word know comes from the... Yada, Y-A-D-A, and it means to know technically, yes, it means to know in detail, so it's a head knowledge, but it more uh, specific. Chandler says pacifically, so I always feel like I'm going to say it wrong, like he's like pacifically, so it specifically means to know by experience and to know face to face. Do you have an experiential relationship with God where you know that he has stepped into your life and you've, you've surrendered to him and you've experienced the strength and the grace that he gives? This is the kind of knowledge God wants us to have, to be still so we can experience his power. And then the, under this final point is just that God is with me. He's in control, but he's also with me. We've touched on that before. Um, sometimes we don't, I'm guilty of this, but we don't live our lives in the presence of God, like knowing that he's with us everywhere we go, um, and, and claiming his help when he wants to give it, I sometimes think to myself what I would be like, this is random, but you'll see where I'm going with this, if I was Moses um, in the desert wilderness for 40 years taking care of sheep, I know I would have created some sort of like drama out of that, like all oh, these sheep, you know, just walking around, I've got to shear these sheep, and they're not obeying me, and I have to go hook them and bring them back over, and we all know sheep are dumb animals, and I think I could just see myself having days where I was just huffing and puffing about sheep. And I, could, I think I could picture myself walking right by a burning bush and thinking, oh, now I've got a fire to put out, you know? <laughs> and here is Moses on the backside of the desert, and props to him for not putting out the fire, you know? Here's a bush that's on fire but not being consumed, and it was the presence of God. He took off his shoes. It's holy ground. And do you know that our lives are full of burning bush moments? Like, God is wanting to reveal himself to you. He's wanting to show himself to you. And sometimes we're just too busy to take off our shoes and acknowledge we're on holy ground. Like, God is with us, and he will help us. So his presence is a comfort. So if you're surrounded by past, present, or future difficulties, 
busyness, struggles, you can know intimately and experientially that God is with you, that his power can enable you. Um, this song in Psalm 46 is often referred to as Luther's Psalm because Martin Luther, during the Reformation, when he was being persecuted for his beliefs, would often go into hiding and he would call the believers that were with him together. And when they didn't know what else to do, uh, this is like several sources cite this, he would say, let's sing Psalm 46 together. And he said it many times, let's sing Psalms 46 together. Um, it is a song of comfort and a song of power. And actually, this is interesting. If you open your Bible, you, you could do this later. But um, this song is introduced with the phrase, a song of um, upon Alamoth, Alamoth. No one really knows for sure what Alamoth means, and there's a couple different thoughts there. But I read something that I'm like, okay, we'll pick that one since no one really knows what it means. Uh, some people believe that it means a song for the women, a song for the women. And as we're here today, let's just claim this as the song for the women, that we are here wanting to reset, get the rest that God wants us to have. And if you look at Psalm 46, is this a song that you can sing? This is a, a note in your... In your um, a quote in your notes I'll read to you and then we'll be done. This is uh, from Charles Spurgeon. He said, it were well if all of us could say Selah under tempestuous trials, but alas, too often we in our haste, may our trembling hands bewildered among the strike the lyre with a rude crash and mar the melody of our life song. So today's challenge is just to embrace the rhythm and the melody of your life song and in order to do that, we have to pause. We have to have Selah, times where we reset, refocus our hearts on God, claim the promises he gives, the strength he gives, the rest that he gives to us, and then move forward, uh, making a beautiful song that he wants to write for your lives. Let's have a word of prayer together. Lord, we thank you so much. Uh, just for a day to uh, set apart and uh, be uh, together as women, encouraging each other in our walk with you. And I know the ladies in this room desire to live a life that is marked by Selah, otherwise they wouldn't be here today. This is a pause in our schedule. It is a moment to reconnect, uh, to, to consider, to reflect, and to reevaluate um, the pace and the rhythm of the song that you um, have chosen for us. And so I pray that we won't waste this moment. I ask that we will leave today just so confident in your power and in your presence, um, in your promises, that no matter where we look, past, present, or in this moment, we will not be overwhelmed by the burdens and by the trials and by the schedules that we are faced with, but Lord, that we will face each of them with confidence and hope and trust in you, and from that place, uh, be replenished to have the strength to move forward and to live lives that please you, and I pray that we will take time today to apply this practically and personally, and that we will make practical steps um, just to um, rearrange our lives.